Amen. Good morning, everyone. Praise God for a beautiful sunny day here at Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church, your home away from home until Jesus comes. Today, we continue moving through Matthew chapter 25, the chapter where Jesus explains what the kingdom of God will be like when he comes. Of course, current events have caused many people to look anew at those prophecies and those passages of scripture. People are now dusting off their prophetic clocks and calendars to see if this time maybe they'll get it right. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And the date when he is returning is one of those secret things. Perhaps we should quit trying to get into his business so much and stay more focused on his business concerning us, amen? Speaking of the things that God has given to us, today I want to talk to you about the idea it isn't just who you know, it's how you know him. And there are many reasons why we may obey somebody, including God. Some obey him out of fear, you know, obeying because you have to. Others obey him for hope of reward, looking forward to getting something in exchange, quid pro quo, if you will. And still others obey him out of love because they love Jesus and they love their neighbor as themselves. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, you have called your church to witness that in Christ, you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. From Article 6 of the Augsburg Confession, concerning the new obedience, it is also taught that such faith should yield good fruit and good works, and that a person must do such good works as God has commanded. For God's sake, but not place trust in them as if thereby to earn grace. Ah. Now, as confessional evangelical Christians, Lutherans, we are known as people who love God's grace. Amen? I mean, so much so that to some, Lutherans think that one can be disobedient even because baptism and Holy Communion gives us a free pass. Now, we're not the only ones of whom that's accused. But usually, the people that are accused of that are so far off the scale in terms of sound doctrine that it's no surprise that they think that way. And so when people accuse us of that, it's always with shock and remorse because, well, they know us to be so, you know, so loving of God's word, so, so focused on sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola Christi. But it is true that baptism and Holy Communion are the means through which God gives his grace of forgiveness to us. And, but it's still faith that appropriates that grace and makes it our own. Yesterday, I was teaching confirmation class over at Good Shepherd. And we, we talked about how faith leads to Obedience. So when you look at the first commandment in the small catechism, it says in the what does this mean? We shall fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But it only says that about the first commandment, which is, of course, you shall have no other God. It doesn't mention that word and trust in the other nine because once you've dealt with that in the first commandment, and so you only have the Lord, your God. 
Well, everything else falls right in line. If you trust him as your God, then you will trust him when he tells you what he wants concerning you. You will trust him when he tells you what is good concerning you. You will trust him when he tells you what life is under the kingdom of heaven. Amen? See, and, and, and I'll be honest, the kingdom of heaven is a difficult concept for Americans to ask. We don't really get what it's like to live under a monarchy, a king, the rule of one person. The idea that one person is the law pretty much leaves our experience once we leave the authority of the home. Ain't that right, Dad? In many households today, the impact of culture has even diluted the authority that the father once exercised, whether directly or through the mom. And I'll be honest, when I was little, I'd much rather have daddy exercise his authority directly. See, when daddy punished me, daddy had a system. He had a routine, if you will. Uh, I did wrong. He caught me in doing wrong. He'd take the belt off of from his waist, he'd tell me to bend over and I would count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, you get it. And it was done. You know, I just had to make sure I cried properly, you know. But when mom whooped me, it was a different story. Dad didn't take it personal. For dad, it was a system. I tell you, you obey. You don't, I punish. Nothing personal. Mom punished me. It was very personal. Because when mom punished me, it was because I disappointed her. I let I showed her that I did And so he wouldn't take the belt off from around her waist. She would take whatever she found. There was a pastor in my room at Board of Education. She educated me until she got tired of educating me. And it's amazing how much stamina my mother had in her little five foot frame. It was much more than 10, 9, 8, yeah. But nowadays, you don't see that so much. Not only that, you look at children in media and entertainment, it seems like the children are presented as the source of wisdom and intelligence. Parents are presented as being out of touch, foolish, and even when it comes to the dads, childish. And in the workplace, the authority exercised by an owner is challenged by unions, government, bureaucrats, and social activists. Now the first three I kind of understand they're the price you pay for being a bad manager. You're a bad manager, workers want to form a union. When you're a bad manager, the government starts to get wind of it. When you're a bad manager, those bureaucrats who have nothing better to do focus their attention on you. But the social activist part, well, that's another story. I think that there are some people that just can't find anything. You know how they say those who can do, those who can't teach? Well, there's a third category. Those who can't even teach, they stir up trouble. Now in politics, the closest thing we have to a monarchy is probably the judiciary system in that at the federal level, once appointed, they serve for life. And there's no one who can overrule the Supreme Court. But it's vital to know the character of the ruler in a monarchy. One's very life could hang in the balance. Now, in the parables of Jesus, this the authority figure always resulted in being cast out into the outer darkness. Check out any one of these parables where the outer darkness is mentioned. It's always because you didn't do what the authority figure said. And by contrast, when you did what the authority figure said, you got promoted. 
The parable in today's lesson continues Jesus' illustration of the nature of the kingdom of heaven at Christ's return. The elements that it shares with the parable of the virgins includes an undetermined absence, the fulfillment or neglect of a responsibility, and reward and punishment as a result. Interestingly, in chapter 25, there is no mention of mercy or forgiveness in these parables. Instead, the underlying theme centers on the concept of watchfulness as the day of Christ's return approaches. In other words, being ready, being watchful, because the Lord is returning as he prophesied in Matthew 24. And so, to our current text, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. He made five talents more. Also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But the one with the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, whatever talents represent in this parable, and I can tell you it doesn't mean what you think it means. According to the English language, it's not about your ability to play the piano or sing a song or do fun rate. No. It's something that belongs to the owner. See, those things that you have, your ability to play, your ability to entertain or speak or convince or cajole or write well, paint well, whatever those things that we call talents are, those are yours. You can do with them what you will. You can use them to the benefit of your neighbor and to the praise of God, or you can use them for yourself. It's all the same. But these things that are called talantas belong to the master. They never pass from the master's ownership to the servant's ownership. They are responsible and answerable to him directly for those talents. They are responsible for doing with those talents what he told them to do. He doesn't give them to him. He entrusts them to him. And he expects to receive them back. Similar parable in Luke 19 Verses 12 through 27 includes the instruction, engage in business until I come, in verse 13. And both of these parables are connected with the manifestation of the kingdom of God at the return of Christ. So now let's see what happens. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them, and he who had received the five talents five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now again, each of these servants are given a portion of the master's goods according to his ability. They're expected to do something in accordance with his ability. The master is showing his knowledge of their ability and his confidence that they will know what is expected and will act accordingly. And how does the master know them? He knows them. He has prepared them for this assignment. And the first two master servants fulfill their master's expectations, are invited to share his joy. And in like manner, our Lord invites us to share in the joy of his work of salvation. He invites us to share the good news that he has hidden in our hearts with others, that they too may enter into the joy of the kingdom of God. He rejoices over every soul that abides in him, 
And the Lord knows that we're not all the same. He knows our levels of maturity. He knows our strengths and weaknesses. He rejoices not in what we do, but in the fact that we put our trust in him and join him in his mission. John 15 and 5 says, I am the branches. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit or from me. To do nothing. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also that you may be able to bear it. Repeat after me. He knows how much. Hey, do you believe that? Do you trust him? Amen, amen. Now, what is the opposite of faith? Some folks say doubt. Others say unbelief. And while there's merit in those answers, I suggest that there is another more draining obstacle in opposition. Fear. Fear in prisons. Faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, faith empowers. Fear disheartens, faith encourages. Fear sickens, faith heals. Fear makes useless, faith makes serviceable. Most of all, fear puts hopelessness at the heart of life, while faith rejoices in its God. Back to our text. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid that I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Do those words, I was afraid, sound familiar to you? Or more to the point, I was afraid, so I hid Reach back to the Garden of Eden. The first time man did not do what the master said. The first time that man knew him but did not know him the right way. I was afraid. When, when, when the serpent says this, he indicates there's no intimacy between them. He viewed his master not as one whom God had blessed to prosper, but as one who had obtained his goods without working for them. His words imply his master obtained his goods either by plundering others or by other nefarious means. According to major lexicons, the Greek word skleros, generally translated as hard, harsh, rough, or unpleasant. This assessment of his master led the servants not to invest talent, but to hide it. He so feared that the master would deal harshly with him for failure, he chose to do nothing. Rather than risk his stewardship as he thought it in a glorious venture of his master's confidence, he buried the master's goods, thus showing that he failed to understand what his master had done. And so, as Job said, that which I feared has come upon me. The master received his confession and gave him what he said. Verse 26, but his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, give it to the one who has 10. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And our Lord's return, there won't be time to get things right. You all remember last week, the parable of the 10 virgins. There won't be time to love your neighbor as yourself. There won't be time to show that your faith is not dead. But more importantly, 
the lesson from today's parable tells us something even more grievous. God gives us, through the preaching of the pure gospel, faith. We receive it in holy baptism with the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what happens if we don't walk by faith? What happens if we don't walk in the Spirit? The Bible is clear. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. If you walk in darkness, you will stumble. If you don't trust in God's exceeding great and precious promises, you won't make use of them. When God says, come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, you refuse to do so because you don't trust him. All you look at him and see him is, is as the one who has wrath. And he appoints it to those who don't obey. And so you lose. But even that. Second Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time, I have listened to you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to take Jesus at his word when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus made himself of no reputation Instead of coming in the fullness of his glory, he humbled himself, took the form of a servant. He served you. He continues to serve you, suffering the cruel death of crucifixion so that we could come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. And so he gives to us his body and his blood. He gives to us anything washed he gives to us sanctification by the presence of the Holy Spirit over and over. Our Lord tells us he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they should come to a repentance. He uses the image of the shepherd with his sheep to show us that his desire is for us. He tells us that the crucifixion was a self-donation of love. Not the cosmic child abuse. Described by those who don't know him. God wants you not to take the no risk road of hiding the light of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Instead, the spirit of liberty in Christ encourages you to trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed upon his faithfulness. The plans that he has for you are plans of peace and not of evil. For the spirit of goodness, the Lord offers in exchange the garment of praise. He fills you with the Holy Spirit, empowers you to speak as his witness, an ambassador of the king. And he knows that thanks to his spirit who dwells in you, you are more than conquerors. Say that after me. I am. More than a conqueror. By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Christ declares in his word concerning us. That's the good news. The Lord is with his people, and he is working in the world through the body of Christ, the church, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Amen. So let the peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord and let all God's people say, Amen.